Good morning, and welcome to what I hope will be an interesting session for everyone, thinking differently with technology, and more specifically, what does treasury really need to transform to real time? Hope it'll be a fun session for you. I've actually done this one before um, in a couple of different locations, and the reception was good, so let's see if we can have fun with it ourselves. Now, a couple housekeeping items. My name is Bob Stark. I'm Global Head of Market Strategy at Kariba. And I'll be spending about 35, 40 minutes in the presentation, which certainly leaves some time for questions at the end. Feel free to submit questions anytime. I will look at them at the end as opposed to going or during the presentation. So um, if I don't answer it right away, don't be offended. It's because, well, I'm presenting and then I will certainly address them at the very end. Now, let's go into what today's session is about. There's obviously a number of different pieces about real-time treasury. We hear about this quite a bit. I'm going to focus on really in two pieces. I'm going to start by talking about some of the real-time technologies. So RPA, artificial intelligence, APIs, just go through them a little bit to give us some context of what we're speaking about when we think about thinking differently with technology. And then we'll really get into what is real-time, um, looking at the progression to what we call extreme or hyper-automation, which these technologies allow getting into integrating real time into our treasury processes and then leveraging APIs for enterprise decision making. So really integrating the concept of real time into our daily lives is really what we want to address towards the end of the presentation. But I'm going to start with this. And it's kind of a, it's a big slide. There's a lot going on here. I do appreciate that. So I know it's relatively early in the morning to look at something this complex, but let me walk you through what's going on in this particular slide, because I think it sets context for the rest of the presentation. So what we see in the middle is data, um, data warehouse, data pool, data lake. They're all different names for much the same thing. It's really all the data and information that you utilize in treasury to make decisions. Now, there's a variety of ways that this could be managed. They can be managed internally within your treasury management system. So that's the way I've represented this, but it could also be something that's managed by your IT group or um, even managed externally by another provider. Typically, we see these data warehouses managed within your treasury management system or done so um, by your internal IT team. And there's a number of different things happening. Typically, when we see a data warehouse, it's because we're looking at things like using that data for machine learning, business intelligence, robotic process. So we're utilizing that data to make better decisions. We're going to go back to this concept quite often during this presentation. You'll also notice that in blue, there's APIs. APIs, again, we will touch on that in more detail, but they really help connect our data warehouse to other uh, components within our system and other data sources. So it could be your ERP more on the right side of the screen. It could be internal data models. It could also be, as you can see on the left side of the screen, different apps that you might be using. Now, we don't wanna confuse apps with your treasury management system. Your treasury management system could be considered a very large app, which is perfectly valid, but we would also look at Things like bank account verification, um, maybe sanction list screening, maybe looking at machine learning and AI and different applications like that. Think of the, I guess, the middle part of this as your phone, your platform, and then all the apps would be linked in via API behind the scenes. That's the kind of way you can think of a screen like this. So if you're kind of thinking, I'm not sure I, I totally understand this, that's okay. We will come back to this in terms of the different technologies that come together. And then we'll talk again about how they get recomposed in a diagram that sort of looks like this. But let's step back for a second and talk about some of the things in the middle of this screen. I'm gonna start with robotic process automation or RPA for short. Many of you are probably very familiar with RPA. RPA is really just automated software that happens to sit outside your technology stack. So it might be something that your IT group has provided, or maybe you just run these in treasury, or maybe you don't have them at all and you would kind of like to. They are just simple software and they do simple things. So you can see some of the examples, extracting software or extracting data actually is what it should say from your ERP, logging in, logging out of multiple systems. So really um, taking automation for multiple tasks, organizing data 
in Excel and then pushing to your treasure management system, your ERP, QA testing and software applications, and then automating process, we'll call it outside of your normal system workflows, which could just be, again, manual process, manual task. It, RPA is really good. You can see on the right side of the screen, I put this uh, highlighted in a cloud, especially for steps across multiple apps. The whole idea of RPA and the best example I can give, it's like a macro in Excel, except you're not in Excel. You are automating tasks that typically cross the boundaries of multiple systems. So with RPA, you can see the cute little diagram here, the cute little uh, GIF that I put in there. When we use RPA, it's usually fairly limited. It's in click heavy processes. So where there's a lot of different mouse clicks, that is a great opportunity for RPA. If we have predictable um, and certainly multiple um, sequences or flows um, that we want to manage, that's a good example to use RPA. If, and you can see, obviously, this is a sort of a playful bot that maybe has some trouble kicking the football, but tasks that do not require subjective decision-making. Bots, they do what they do. And if you try and go out that, they're going to figuratively fall over like this poor guy. So that's, you know, we have to think about RPA as pure automation, predictable in advanced programming. What it's not going to do is be able to think for you. It's not going to be able to do more than what you've asked it to. So we have to think of what is the right opportunity for RPA. We have to think of who's owning that. We have to think of how it gets maintained. And certainly we want to consider the cost. These are all, we'll call it considerations, but reasons that may or may not make robotic process automation a good fit within your treasury team. Generally speaking, we have a lot of clients of ours that use these in conjunction with RTMS. It's quite predictable that you would get data into your TMS um, using RPA if you didn't have an API or that level of automation to integrate those systems together, as an example. So that's where we commonly see them and some of the examples that I talked about before. Now, I have an opinion on RPA and I'm going to share it with you. Take it for what it is. But generally speaking, RPA kind of compensates for something that's not there. It's either in terms of automation that's not within your treasury or ERP system, or it's automation that's not there to connect systems together. The emergence of APIs, and I'll get into this a little bit more, in many cases makes the need for RPA or robotic process, these bots obsolete because they are simply there to compensate for automation that wasn't put in place. If you have the right automation in your systems and you have APIs to connect them and integrate them, then most of the needs for RPA are starting to melt away. So that's just an opinion that I wanted to add, but it's something to consider when you're thinking of, do I need bots in my system, in my system, in my technology stack? The answer may be no, if you have the right level of automation APIs in place. So we'll come back to this concept. Now, let's talk about artificial intelligence briefly. I don't want to spend a lot of time. We could do a whole presentation on, on our AI or automation. Um, and I don't want to do that for today because I want to really get into the concept of real-time treasury. But if you look at a slide like this, and I use this quite often in a variety of presentations, most of what we see for artificial intelligence is kind of, if I use my mouse here, really more on the left side of this diagram. So we see a lot of um, machine learning, uh, as they're called algorithms, and they're not really machine learning when they're rules-based automation, but some people will call them that anyways. Uh, and these are more the pre-programmed. It's pretty close to some of the bots that we would see for RPA, but there's a little bit more complex than your typical, like your simple bot. So some people will call this rules-based automation. I would argue it, but nonetheless, we see a lot of examples out there. Most of the machine learning where it's actually more artificial intelligence is in this middle part, the cognitive automation. And that's where we start to see things, and I'll share some examples in the following slides, but that's where we start to see for payments, like looking for payment fraud or payment anomalies. That's where we start to see for cash forecasting, predicting, say, accounts receivable as an example and where those cash flows might go based on history. That's where we really get into the cognitive automation. And generally, again, it's more on the left side. It's more pattern-based than knowledge-based. 
but we are starting to see some of those examples, but it is a continuum. Um, more, you know, the further right you go, the more deep learning that we have. Now, candidly in treasury, there's really, there's really no, um, maybe I'll just say very little to be conservative. Uh, examples of deep learning and true artificial intelligence. Most of what we see in machine learning, they're either rules-based or some element of cognitive automation, but they do provide something that allows us to get some additional levels of automation in real time. Now, let me give you a couple of examples. So this is one of my favorite slides. For any of you who've seen one of my presentations before, you've probably seen this one. This idea of machine learning, it uses most of these, these cognitive automation, they use what's called structured data. Structured data, the best way to represent it is in this slide. So if you look at the inputs on the far left side of the screen, we have some of our famous cartoon characters. We have Donald Duck, who is clearly a duck. We have Daisy Duck, who is also a duck. And then we have Bugs Bunny, and I think we can all agree, not a duck. So these are the inputs that you provide and you label it. So you identify duck, duck, not duck. You teach the cognitive-based machine learning algorithm what these are, and then you give new inputs. And this is where the prediction parts. You're training over here. And then once those inputs, and obviously it's more than just three pieces of data, but once it sees that, then it can learn, here's the characteristics that make a duck. And as a result, you give it a Daffy Duck or you give it Mickey Mouse. And what's going to happen? It should, if it's trained well, be able to determine Mickey Mouse is not a duck. Daffy Duck is a duck. It's Now, this is obviously a simplistic kind of fun example, but hopefully you get the idea that this is the kind of application that we'd expect to see in treasury. We would see examples like these are the types of payments that we'd be making. This is the type of data that we would expect to see in our MT940 or XML file for bank statement reporting. So it's structured data that a program can learn from to identify this is what you normally see. Now let's make a prediction or let's um, suggest that there's an anomaly or something that we can predict the outcome of. So we can predict that this is when the cash flow should appear in our forecast. This is the type of payment that maybe we shouldn't be seeing because it's anomalous. It's different than what we typically make in terms of amount, in terms of day of week, in terms of supplier, in terms of levels of approval, whatever the characteristics. So that's in concept how it works. Now let's look at something a bit more practical. This is just a typical bank statement. I think if I'm Dissecting this a little bit more, it would be an XML file. Um, so there's a number of different components to this. You can kind of see them for yourself. I won't go through all of them. You can train a machine learning algorithm. This would be more rules-based automation on the sort of left side, simplistic part of the scale. But you can train it to look for different pieces of the comment field or the reference number within the bank statement to be able to then strip out those pieces and appropriately categorize those so that no matter how the information is presented in the message or in the bank file, you can have those identified and then put in the right places within your database to be able to reconcile cash flows, be able to appropriately tag them for journal entries and accounting, et cetera, et cetera, however you want to use that. Even for things like cash application, you'd be able to use a program like this. So this is a very simple example, nothing too, too complex, but it gives you an idea of how machine learning can work in real time. So what would we expect to use machine learning for? There's a lot of different examples that we see right now within Treasury. Cash forecasting is certainly one, um, typically more on the AR side than the AP side, just because, well, AR is a little bit harder to predict. So you're looking for a little bit more history to give you some guidance. Payments fraud, certainly identifying suspicious or anomalous payments is very common. Um, we'll call it recognition of characters, such as, is it an I or is it number one? Because they can obviously look somewhat similar in a bank statement. Uh, reconciliation, trading example, these are the sorts of things that we'd expect to have. Generally, it's supervised learning based on structured data, um, but it can certainly be a helpful hand on the journey to automation in real time. And we'll go back into this in a few moments as well. 
So the third part though, and I don't want to jump away too much, but I just wanted to go through these technologies relatively quickly before we get to the fun part of the presentation is this concept of APIs. We've all heard of APIs. In fact, I'm sure we're almost beat over the head, so to speak, in the amount of information that is shown by, about APIs. We see articles, we see pitches, we see sales presentations, all of them talking about, oh, APIs, this, APIs, that. They're changing open banking. They're making all sorts of services available, et cetera, et cetera. In simple terms, though, if you look at the statement across the top of the screen, APIs will connect everything we just talked about your apps, your bots, your software, your machine learning algorithm, all of that in real time, which is a really, really important concept. So it would basically allows you to have your data, your workflows, your processes all integrated together so that whatever processing, whatever information, whatever decision-making, whatever recommendations you want to make can all be done instantly. API brings the instant part of this equation. And so we'll go into a couple examples in a moment, but I just want to kind of let you know, this is a really important concept in terms of APIs. Most people think of APIs as just bank connectors. You know, you connect via, whether it's, let's say it's Vax or it's Swift or it's Ebix, if we're say connecting in Germany or Switzerland or in France, and we think of, oh, API is just a better way to connect to the bank. Well, Yes, absolutely. That's one use. But what we're going to get into is that there's actually significantly more opportunities than just connecting to your bank more quickly. And APIs really allow that. So it allows you to build and connect multiple systems together in real time to be able to do more things and interesting stuff in Treasury. Now, that sounds all very vague. Let's get to something that's a bit more specific. In this example, you can see, and I've broken it out by cash and payments and then more liquidity planning, could have made many more categories, but just for fun, focused on something that was relatively simple and easy. So in this, what we look at is a progression from manual to automated. And I'm sure most of you that are listening are probably in the automated. And if you're not, well, I'm sure you will get there at some point soon. But if you think of that progression from manual to automated, for all of you that maybe implemented treasury management systems or implemented ERP systems, you can imagine, oh yes, I remember what manual was like. I was doing all these things that are in the left side of the screen. And suddenly when I got automation, it was, things were much easier. Well, think of that, if you can imagine that or remember that progression from manual to automated, it's much the same in terms of automated to API driven. So it allows, it's that similar jump. It's a transformation process, not just something that doing the same thing, but faster. So if you look at some of these examples on the cash management side, we get things like real-time bank reporting that's possible and enabled by API. Instant investments and in funding and EBAM. EBAM, I know most of you will have the eye roll thinking, oh, EBAM, we've heard about that one before. I won't use this conversation to debate the merits or possibilities for EBAM, except to say that you can now have with an API, it allows this conversation, a multiple conversation to go back and forth. I'll give you an example. So a lot of the APIs that we have with banks that we develop with, I, mean, I won't name names of banks, but there's a variety of them that we've done. Typically, the way they work is that they're not just for one thing. Um, now, there may be multiple APIs that are strung together, but a typical sequence of conversation would be you have the user um, that would actually call up the API, and simply what they're looking for is a real-time balance report. So they just want to query in real time of what their balance is for a certain account. And they get that, and let's just say it's 100,000 pounds. Then what they do is acknowledge, okay, we have a positive balance, then they can initiate an instant or real-time payment. And then they can, so that's two things that are happening. The third thing that would happening is that they again, check the real-time balance to be able to understand, okay, did the payment settle? And what is my updated bank balance? That would be an example of three different things that are happening, but they're all driven instantly by API. It takes literally a second to do everything that I just talked about. Um, that's the what we talk about with API. So it's multiple pieces together 
that can allow you to have more of a real-time experience. If you think of what I just described versus what you're doing now, you may find, okay, well, I get my prior day and then my uh, current day reporting, depending on the accounts and where they're distributed around the world. You probably get those embargoed information. You probably get those maybe a couple of times a day, um, but not instantly, not on demand. Real-time bank reporting by API allows that to be on demand. The payments part, the instant or real-time payments and acknowledgements allows those payments to be sent and settled literally in milliseconds, so less than a second round trip. These are the kinds of things that you can start to couple these processes together, and that gives you a capability that you did not have before. So suddenly you can see your cash and liquidity in real time. And then you can start using some of these capabilities such as artificial intelligence or use some of these, say, robo-advisors to be able to make decisions more instantly, such as what am I going to do with my cash and liquidity? Now that I know that I have um, a bank balance for half the day, maybe I'm going to invest that for a couple of hours. I know that seems something that you can't do right now, but we are progressing that way. And that's what APIs are starting to open up. So the platforms, if you think of the different pieces, are starting to become available so that this right-hand column is very close. In some cases, it's reality, like real-time bank reporting. There's many banks that offer that. Instant or real-time payments, there's many banks that offer that. In terms of validation of bank accounts or detecting suspicious or non-compliant payments, there's many platforms that are already providing that. So we are starting to, in terms of today, never mind looking forward to tomorrow, start to see these use cases becoming available to us as a real-time capability, as an accessory to your bank platform, your treasury management system, or even as an app within your ERP. So it's a lot to throw at you and I appreciate that. But let me even drill down a little bit further because most of you are trying to think, oh, I don't know if I, I like the sound of that, but I don't think I really have those capabilities or I'm not sure how that exactly fits into my world, which is a reasonable question. So let's go into payments. This is the way that I typically explain it. There's a number of different examples. I could have chosen cash management, could have chosen liquidity or FX, but let's just use payments because I think it's something that we all understand. If you look at this slide, there's a couple of things happening here. Obviously, I threw some logos in for fun, but really what we're trying to say is that typical payment journey is you initiate your payment. It could be in your treasury management system, could be in your ERP, could be in both of those systems combined and then centralized to send them to the bank. That process should be automated. And if it's via an API right now versus one of the traditional ways of sending payments to the banks, then you'll find that if it's an API, it's probably an instant journey, a little bit quicker. And in terms of the acknowledgements, maybe say if it's using SwiftNet, you might get GPI. So you actually get a bit more transparency than you did before, but it's pretty much what you're doing today. I think most of you can recognize, yeah, this seems very familiar. I approve payments and I send them to the bank and then I get an acknowledgement. So let's presume that everyone has automation around this area. Now, let's start to add some real-time capabilities to this journey. So what we have are new payment methods. And I've thrown a couple in here. Some of them are American examples. Um, so like FedNow is an example. Zelle is one that's popping up in the United States quite often. Um, you look at SAP Instant Payments. I threw a couple other ones that are out of APAC. Regardless of the payment method. The point is, is that there's new payment choices that are becoming available and APIs are what are introducing those capabilities. So you can't do an instant payment via a file-based transfer because the file-based transfer at minimum is about a 15 minute round trip from payment initiation to processing by the bank and then the acknowledgement back to you. That's not instant. If you're doing an instant payment, you're looking for an instant irrevocable payment that settles literally the moment you send it. So as a result, banks are, and even neobanks and even non-banks, so I shouldn't necessarily say just banks, but all of these different platforms 
are providing APIs as the conduit to remit these payment instructions. So immediately what we get with APIs and hence in real time are new types of payments, which we may decide that we like and we want to use, or we may find, well, that's interesting, but I don't have a big need for that right now. Uh, I did a presentation like this at the in the United States at the uh, AFP conference, which is a couple of weeks ago. And it was in person. So I was able to ask people just to put up their hands. Most people, about 50, 60% of the audience said that they were either looking at or already using these types of payments. So, but that said, they weren't using them for everything. They were just using them for a certain workflow. So it was nice to have this capability, but it wasn't something they were replacing all of their other payments with. I suspect most of you are probably the same. So let's just say that this is a nice avenue or a nice option to have. And it's one capability and one new option that we have that's available to us as part of our real-time payment experience. Now, let's enrich this a little bit more. And let's look at this concept of internal governance. Most of you probably do something like this within either for your treasury payments or ideally for your treasury and your AP or supplier payments as well. And the key behind this, obviously, and I'll drill into it in a moment, is that this is a new set of capabilities. It's not something that was introduced by a concept of real time, but the real time part of this is that you don't, there's a couple of things. One is that you probably have a lot of payments that need to be screened, whether they're real-time payments or normal payments, it doesn't really matter. It's a new set of requirements that's been introduced. Typically, Treasury is responsible for it, but it may be Treasury in concert with the AP side to, we'll just say, do different things to your payment file to ensure that these are the correct payments and there's no mistakes or even worse, that there's no fraudulent payments. So some of these examples, um, sanctionless screening, policy compliance. When I say policy compliance, a lot of organizations are digitizing their payments policy and then being able to check all their payments in real time against that payment policy. Um, fraud detection in terms of finding anomalous payments, that's another example. So I'll drill into this in a little bit more detail, but the point of showing all this together is that if you looked at payments five years ago, it was more, I'm even going to, dare I say, back up, it was more like this. This is typically, and this may be actually what your payments are today, but certainly five years ago, this was our experience. Since then, what we've had is we have new payment methods, we have new options to consider. And then on top of that, we have this concept of the internal governance. And so it's really this idea that we have more capabilities and we have more needs to ensure that our payments are secure, which are helped by the real-time experience and availability via API. So if we drill down into this in a little bit more detail, just breaking down this piece of the payment journey, what's increased, like what's driven that increased demand? Well, it's fraud. Um, it's also the fact that if you are sending real-time payments, what you don't want to do is slow down that entire journey simply because you have to do more things. You have to ensure that these payments are actually aligning with your payment policy, that they're the scenarios that you might be worried about, such as does this bank account actually belong to the organization that I think I'm paying, as an example, um, are these typical payments Um or is there something unique about them that maybe requires a further look? Quarantine of those payments, as an example. I hesitate saying the word quarantine these days. Used to make <laughs> used to be a safer word about two years ago, but since then maybe <laughs> has different connotations. But it's still this idea that there's additional levels of approval in certain scenarios where the payment's just that much different. These are the sorts of capabilities that every organization is doing. You may not call it internal governance. You might call it compliance. You might call it just the extra stuff we have to do, whatever it is. The point is, is that these are requirements that if you are doing them, what you don't want to do is add 15 or 30 or 60 minutes to that payment journey to do the internal governance or compliance. So as a result, APIs allow us to bring these kind of capabilities in, whether they're within your payment software or whether they're just capabilities or services that are outside 
your payments platform, your ERP platform, you can use an API to be able to bring those in in real time so that everything is completely automated end to end. So that what you get is that this entire, going back to the slide, this entire journey from initiation, whether we have new types of channels, whether we do some or all of this level of governance, then we send it to the bank or neobank or maybe not even non-bank platform. And then we return journey back to your initiating system with the acts and confirmations. All of that can be done in effectively real time. And that's the capabilities that the API, which is a really powerful part of this conversation, as you can gather from the way I'm presenting it, that API allows us to be able to do all of this instantly rather than having to add time to our payment journey. So as I said, payments is certainly just one part of this. But if you look at what we're able to do is that, I titled this slide sort of playfully, APIs are the secret weapon to drive real time. So it's the unifying of data, bringing it all together so you can perform processes like artificial intelligence. You can do screening. You can take your history of all of your cash flows and use those to predict what your next set of cash flows in your forecast might be. Or you can, from a payment standpoint that we just looked at that example, you can bring all your payment history in and then screen each new payment against that history to see, does this actually match with the kind of payment that we typically make? Or is it something that maybe is a little bit anomalous and we should probably have a look at it? So it's connecting these different processes and connecting those processes could be internal processes or it could be bringing in external apps into the conversation. Regardless, it gives you this concept, and I know there's a lot happening on this slide, but it gives you that enterprise visibility and enterprise control and view of your enterprise liquidity. So what does that mean? It means that typically... Most of our systems are what we call a system of record. It's a database. It captures information and you look at that information, you say, oh, great, I have all the information. I have all my payment instructions. Uh, I'm now going to use my system as a system of engagement, meaning I'm gonna connect it to the bank to be able to send those payments in that example. But APIs also allow you to make it into a more of a system of intelligence. And that's where this data unification, this first point on the right side really matters. So everything that we're talking about here, it's not just about speeding up what you are already doing. It's adding additional levels of analysis and decision-making to what you had already. So it really is this concept of transforming your process to become more intelligent in your system by bringing in new apps, new data, and new like we'll say decision-making tools that can help you make um, a more informed decision around what you're doing with your cash, liquidity, FX, you name it. So obviously we're talking treasury and I'm not going to stray too far from treasury in this example, except to say a couple of different things. One is that APIs create this concept of it's a composable financial system. That's not a term that I invented. It's actually Gartner, a big think tank um, out of the States that actually they've created this term called composable financial system. And really what it is, is it's taking this broken up diagram and putting it together via things such as APIs. So if you want to have your machine learning, you want to have your RPA, your bots, you want to have other applications that maybe are part of an ERP or maybe not part of an ERP. You want to have your TMS and your ERP system connected. You want to have all your trading portals connected. You want to have your payroll and HR information integrated into your bank account management database to make sure that all the people that are supposed to be signatories and bank accounts are actually still working at your organization. I know some of you think, oh, okay, well, that's no problem for us. Trust me, there's so many times where I see that as, an, as a problem. So these are the sorts of things when we talk about unifying data and driving decision-making is that in that example I just gave in terms of bank account management and, and HR, if there's any sort of change in your HR system in real time, that is available to your bank account management system. Those are the sorts of things that we talk about when we're saying a composable financial system and real-time decision-making. That's just one example. And there's obviously a variety of ones we could go through if we had more time. But the key point here is that APIs really are that glue that makes this concept of real-time happen. Now, if you look at this and you think, okay, I 
even though there's a lot going on here, there's some things that I'm very interested in that I've heard about in this presentation. Is it an all or nothing proposition? Of course not. Um, Real-time adoption, it's a continuum. It starts, but as you can see, I put on the slide, does not end with productivity. A lot of these capabilities and a lot of the technology that's out there are meant to automate things that weren't there. So we talked about bots like robotic process automation. Those are really designed just for productivity. But if you think of some of the real-time capabilities that we have, even the artificial intelligence and machine learning, that allows us to move from automation and productivity to more informed decisions. If you think of the continuum of what we're trying to do in treasury and finance, we're probably in a position where not just creating more efficiency within treasury, but also moving to more enterprise level risk management and to the right side of the screen, ultimately to a point where we have more enterprise data, enterprise analysis, and enterprise decision making. You can see some of the examples I put on the right side of the screen. So the point is, um, and this is kind of where I'll conclude the presentation on this particular slide is that technology, it automates. Like Obviously, that's the first thing, but it's not the last thing. So whether it's robotic process automation, it's on the rules-based or cognitive algorithms, it's machine learning, whether it's even just the basic capabilities of APIs, it's meant to automate, to create productivity, so you can then be freed up to figure out how do I want to transform and do this process a little better. APIs will play a role. They connect everything. They connect your banks. They connect whatever software platforms you have. They connect your data and these internal or external apps, and they can do it all in real time. So as I said before, it's not just about bank connectors. Um, it's not just about making sure that your ERP or treasury system connects to your bank quickly and more quickly, like a faster connection than what you had before. That is one outcome, but it not the only outcome. In fact, it's probably one of the least important capabilities there. Open platforms allow you to compose these pieces together. And that's where we get to the right side of the screen. That's the concept of data unification. So we're able to deliver this enterprise level visibility and decision-making, but also do it in real time. So it's a lot to throw at you. And I apologize for going through it so, so fast. I know it's uh, you know not even lunchtime and that was quite a bit of information and pictures to throw at you. But hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea of some of the possibilities that are there. So I have my phone up so I can see um, some of the questions. So if I'm looking down, it's basically to make sure um, some of the questions you have. And there's a few that are coming through. So I'm gonna just answer those. Feel free to submit them through, um, through the Q&A part and then I will see them. So first question, how do I stop looking at just digitizing or speeding up existing processes and go back to basics? Is it worth the time it would take to engage in this undertaking? The best answer I would say is yes, it probably is worth it. Uh, I use the word transformation and I don't use it lightly. Uh, transformation obviously requires, it requires work. It requires effort. It requires rethinking what your existing processes were. The key thing, and, and let's take real time off the table for just one moment and just talk about a simple transformation of, let's just say it's a treasury management system because, well, Kariba, that's what we do. So I, I know that part well. Anyone that's going down the path of a, of a treasury management system, and I'm sure many of you have already done this, so you can commiserate with this, is that when you go from your initial implementation of any system, TMS or otherwise, what you're not doing is just automating what you did before. And you're looking to transform. You're looking to see what does this tool do that allows me to do cash management or positioning or forecasting or whatever the outcomes you're looking for differently and better than I was able to do before, as opposed to just making it quicker. And that's the key thing that we're trying to do here. This movement from automated to real time, it's not just about doing payments quicker. It's not just about getting your bank balances quicker. It's about being able to take advantage of the unification of data, of bringing and composing systems together, about actually reimagining how I would actually take the process of sending payments or approving payments or even screening payments so that the bad things don't happen. It's about looking at what can I do better 
and I think that's the point of the question is what can I do better than I was doing before? And what does these, these new capabilities that give me real time processing offer that I really didn't have before? So sort of a, a longer answer to your short question. The short answer was yes. <laughs> the longer answer is this is the way that I typically think about it. Technology is there to enable a better process. It's not there just to automate. So, um, and I'll keep going through the questions. So next one is there's so many changes occurring in our business, in payment processes with blockchain, et cetera. How do I start? And should I wait until things settle down? It's a good question. I'd carve out the blockchain part and I'd say, I don't want to say wait till it settles down, but wait to ensure that your use case is actually appropriate for what you want to accomplish. And that's kind of a, maybe a vague way of saying it. So let me be a bit more precise is if you look at something like blockchain or even let's just say daringly digital or cryptocurrencies, if you don't know what it's going to do for you, then that's kind of the answer to the question. It, even if real time or instant payments, if you think, why do I need those? Then the answer, and you really do a, you know, a good look at, at what those are going to offer for you. And you think, oh, that's not what I need yet. I don't see the value in it. That is the answer to your question, in my opinion, is technology is not, you don't want it to be a solution in search of a problem. What you want it to be is something that actually gives you a positive outcome that actually has some value attached to it. So in my opinion, that would be the way that I would approach that is to ensure that we are in a position where it's actually offering you something, um, I guess we'll say interesting, but useful for you. Um, last question I will I will answer There's a couple actually asking about Kriba specifically. I won't answer those here, but we can answer those offline. Um, so last question is how much more additional security is required for API processes uh, from cyber risk? I think this is a really good question. There's really good answers in terms of security with APIs. You can actually embed much more security if you want to call it that into the API, there's more built into that connector, um, as opposed to in many cases where you're building connectivity yourself, you were in a position where you really had to actually compose those systems together. So you would have the connector, you'd have the format, you would have the security, maybe it was like PGP or thing, something like that, whatever the bank told you you had to do to connect. And in the API, it's the security is a bit more reimagined. It doesn't mean that there's anything, I guess I was going to say insecure, non-secure, unsecure. Unsecure is the word I'm going to go with. It's not like there's anything unsecure about traditional ways of connecting with banks or ERPs, but you there are opportunities to make it even a little bit better. Certainly, it's as good as any connector that you have in front of you right now. And in fact, it may offer some things that are even a little bit better. So that's the way I'd answer that. I can certainly detail it more offline if you'd like. But... In my view, it's definitely an opportunity to uh, to at least have the same, if not better, security for your connectors between banks, ERPs, and your treasury systems. So with that, I will end uh, this presentation and say thank you all for your attention. I very much appreciate it. If there's anything I can answer after the fact, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so thanks very much, and I wish you all a great final day of the event. Thank you for your time. Bye.